Hello guys, and uh, today we are going to talk about the 5-7 chord, the dominant 7 chord, aka the 7th chord. Um, when you hear a musician, there are three types of, uh, technically speaking, and don't take this too literally, uh, there are three types of 7th chord in the sense that you can add a third onto a triad, say C, E, G, B, that will give you a major 7th. Uh, if I tag... Um, Another third onto a minor chord, uh, say D minor, D, F, A, C, that's a minor seventh. But a dominant seventh is different. And again, the languaging uh, we use is a little vague and incorrect and be nice if it was all cleaned up. Um, but when you hear a musician talk about a seventh chord, they're not talking about a minor seventh or a, do or a uh, major seventh. They're talking about the dominant seventh chord. And... Um, that's called the 5-7. Now, let's clear things up here. 5-7. If you just hear those two words, you think of two numbers, the number 5 and the number 7. But uh, what they don't uh, tell you is that the 5 represents the fifth step of sub, sub key. And the number 7, the Arabic numeral 7, refers to, I've built the chord up to in thirds to the 7th, okay? So uh, root third, fifth, flat seventh. Um, some people have called it a flat seven chord. I mean, you know, it's, it's all tricky the way the language goes. That's definitely not clear and not correct. Don't call it a flat seven chord, even though it has the flat at seventh interval. It's a five seven or a dominant seven. Myself personally, my preference is to call it uh, um, a dominant seventh chord or a dominant chord. This way we know for sure that we're dealing with this type of chord. Now even the, this five um, can be a little tricky in the explanation because the assumption is it's going to a target. Um, the fifth step of the key of C is G7. The target chord is C itself. G7 resolves to C. So Five, uh, G7 is five steps from its target C. So that's the um, implication of a 5-7, but the thing about the 5-7 is it's so damn versatile. Like, for example, there's such, uh, such a thing as the flat two dominant seventh, which is known as a tritone substitution. Don't worry about that languaging. We're, we'll get to tritone substitutions later on down the line. Today we're gonna touch on the first type which is uh, secondary dominance. We're just gonna touch on it. I'll go deeper into it in the next video. Right now, we're gonna talk about why a 5-7 is a 5-7. And to me, this is a fascinating explora exploration. Um, there's an interval inside of the dominant seventh chord that you will not find inside of a major seven or a minor seven chord. That's a very unique interval, and it's probably one of the most tense intervals in music and it's called the tritone. And why is it called a tritone? Because it consists of three whole steps within a scale. So, if I were to look at the key of C over here, on, in this bracket is showing you F, G, A, B, whole, 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 three whole steps between F and B, all right? That gives you a very particular kind of sound, which is this. And if you're used to, uh, if you know some of the old 60s European movies, the old European sirens used to sound like. I guess they chose a triad, uh, a tritone because it's the most distant interval and it gets your attention. Um, but what that tritone interval does, first of all, um, you'll, you'll find that in the key of C. Now, let's, let's look at this in terms of not that it's three whole steps, but just the amount of steps. In other words, it's one, two, one, one, two, three, four steps. So it's, this is a fourth. But this particular fourth is three whole steps. If I go from C to F, one, two, three, four, I get whole, whole, half. If I go D to G, one, two, three, four, I get whole, half, whole. So again, that's two and a half, not three. If I go E to A, E to F is a half step, F to G is a whole step, G to A is a whole step, two and a half steps. F to B is three whole steps, whole, whole, whole. G to C is two and a half, as you can see, whole, whole, half. 
A to B is two and a half. A, B is a hole and a half here and another hole. Uh, and B to E, half step, whole, whole. So everything else is a perfect fourth, all right? But the tritone interval is a sharp four, a raised fourth, okay? Three whole steps. I will not find that interval anywhere else in the scale unless I invert this interval and go from B to F. And the interesting phenomenon here is it's the same exact distance as it was from F to B. Let me explain this. If I go from C up to A, I get one, th six steps. One, two, three, four, five, six. And if I count the intervals, it's one, a whole, whole, and a half. So that's two and a half, three and a half, four and a half steps to A. But I can invert that interval, go A to C, and then I get one and a half steps. The weird property of the tritone is that when you invert it, you come up with the same distance. All right, so it may be one, two, three, four, five steps, yes, but it's still three whole steps. Here's a half step, then a whole, so that's one and a half, then a whole, one and a half, then another half step, three whole steps, okay? Even though they're not organized as proper whole steps like this one is, it's still, what it's calculating is that distance, okay? So uh, it's the same distance. Um, uh, you can see as we count them, it's just that the whole steps are broken up into half steps in this when we go B to F. Here we have three pure whole steps. Here we have a half step here and a half step here. We add them together, we still get three whole steps. Well, I hope that makes sense, all right? <coughs> so now the G7 chord in the key of C contains those two notes F to B, that tritone interval. And the beautiful thing to notice here wants to resolve to a C chord, correct? Now this F note is drawn down, is attracted down one half step, and this B note is attracted up one half step. So the sound we get is, and you can hear that resolution uh, inside G7 to C. And in fact, this note FB is the flat seven and the third of a G7 chord. When I do that, when I resolve it, this is the third of a C chord and the root of a C chord. You can hear that resolution. That's why, oh, sorry. <laughs> Inside. Again, B wants to go up to C, F wants to go down to E. So it is this property that, that uh, creates a dominant chord. And by the way, there are minor chords that contain this interval. This is why I contend that the 5-7 chord does not have to be major basic. It can also be a minor bass chord. Um, if I take a, um, let's see. This is a uh, D minor 6. All right. Um, there's a Beatles song that uses this, but I, I can't remember. It's uh, it's definitely um, Happiness is a Warm Gun, but I, I, for, um, I forget right now. It slips my mind where that chord is. But in any case, um, now this D minor 6 has the same interval B to C in it. I, I'm sorry, no, I mean... Uh, uh, B and F as the G7 has. Now listen to a G7 resolve to a C. Now listen to D minor 6 resolve to C. You can hear it resolving, okay? So yes, academia, there is such thing as a minor dominant chord. Any chord that uh, uh, contains the tritone interval has the dominant quality, meaning that these notes will want to, will be attracted somewhere. Um, okay, those two notes will be attracted somewhere when you have a tritone. This is part of the incredible existential mystery of music itself because how is it that we hear this? I'm pretty sure that dogs and cats can't hear resolution in music. They just hear kind of a blob of sound, but they can't make patterned sense out of it where our minds can. And just a little side note here, I had this wonderful guitar student who um, used to be an acoustical scientist for the Moog synthesizer company. And uh, we used to have these wonderful conversations after the guitar lesson. And he told me that uh, brain science has discovered that 
the part of the brain in a human being um, that processes music, they discovered there is one in the first place, and not only that, but it existed from the beginning of the human brain. So in other words, it was prior to music itself. That suggests that there must be some sort of intelligent force that puts, put us together in uh, one piece. How intelligent, I'm not sure, because look at the world. I mean, there's so much violence in it. Uh, if I was God, I think I'd run things differently. I don't like this concept of dying at the end of your life. Where'd that come from? Um, in any case, uh, <laughs> enough philosophy. <laughs> I'm just in a mood today. Um, all right, so uh, where do we go from here? Uh, yes, I think I said earlier, you can literally write a book about the 5-7 chord, and indeed, books have been written about the 5-7 chord. In my book, I was going to dedicate an entire chapter to the 5-7 when I realized that it flows through the three systems and has three different functions in the three systems. All right, now, we're going to discuss those functions. In the Greek modes, there was no key interaction, so the seventh chord could only resolve to the one chord of the key it was in. Uh, so in the key of C, for example, that G7 in the key of C served to identify the key of C itself. I've spoken about this before. The C chord cannot identify the key of C in just using the one chord. Why? Because you could find a C chord in the key of F and you could find a C chord in the key of G. Same thing with the minor chords. They cross through different keys. But in the Greek system, there is one unique dominant seventh chord per key. In other words, you won't find a G7 in any of the other major keys. Each one has a, a unique seventh chord based on the 12 different steps of our chromatic scale. Now, when temperament occurred, um, what happened was interesting because now they created 12 more keys known as the minor keys. And boy, did that fuck up the system ever. Um, because why, I've mentioned this a hundred times, in the major minor key system, a key means a root. This is so wrong. It's ridiculously wrong. And uh, nobody's come along to correct this, uh, say for moi. I'd love to hear if anybody else has spoken about this on the internet or elsewhere. Um, in any case, let's talk about the function. Okay, we're going to continue talking about the function. So in the Greek modes, the, the the seventh chord had one function and one function only to resolve to the one chord of a key. And you could also say that it serves to identify the key you're in. In other words, G7 would be the thumbprint of the key of C major. However, uh, we spoke about the minor keys, how they were developed, uh, the um, harmonic and melodic minor keys, they call them. Um, and uh, here's what happened. If I were to compare in parallel the key of A major to the key of A minor. Here we have the key of A major above, and we notice five steps up, we get an E7. So our target is A major. E7 resolves to A major. That's a five, seven. It's a seventh chord at the fifth step. Now look at the key of A minor. Despite all these abstract chords in here, diminished and uh, augmented chords, when I go to the fifth step, I get an E7. So what does that mean? No longer can E7 define the key of A. No longer can we say, oh, there's an E7, that we must be in the key of A. Because we can also be in, not in the key of A major, but the key of A minor as well. So uh, now what happens is that the dominant seventh chord has six functions as opposed to one function in the Greek modes. First of all, uh, a 5-7 could be five steps away from a one chord, a major chord. A 5-7 could be five steps away from a minor chord, and a 5-7 could be five steps away from a 5-7 chord. This has to do with uh, something called secondary dominance, and again, we're only going to touch on it a little today, but I'm going to go deeply into it, and you're going to see how this all works and what scales to use in certain situations when you see secondary dominance. So there's three functions, 5-7 to one major, 5-7 to one minor, 5-7 to one dominant seven, okay? The other one is something called a tritone substitution. Uh, let me give you an earful of that. So if I have a C chord, basically uh, a tritone substitution chord resolves down a half step. Now, if I go, that tritone interval, although uh, the chord G7 is unique to the key of C, even in the Greek mode system, if we think about that, 
D flat seven is unique to the key of F sharp. However, the tritone, that particular tritone in the uh, in the D D flat seven chord. Here, look at this. Here's uh, here's my tritone. If I make a G seven chord. That same tritone, it exists in the D flat seven chord. The interesting thing is their roles become reversed. In other words, in the G seven chord, F is the flat seven. In the D flat seven chord, F is the three. In the uh, G seven chord, B is the third. But in the D flat seven, it becomes the flat seven. So the roles are reversed. That F and that B, their roles reverse uh, from um, three to flat seven to flat seven to three. Okay. Hope that made sense. If you explore those two chords on your guitar, you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, best to explore those two chords, of course, on a piano. And one thing I always tell my students is try to learn something about the piano. Don't become a piano player if you want to play guitar, but learn how to form chords and scales on the piano because from that you will learn so much. Like I said, the guitar is a clusterfuck because of its redundancies. Um, I'm not going to, I think I gave you the example of how you could find a, a G major scale in one octave in only one place on the piano and on the guitar you could find it in 10 different places with 10 different fingerings. Uh, just real quick. insane right this is why the guitar is so so difficult all the okay ungraceful edit and back to the video um, all right so we see that aside from the um, redundancy of the G scale on the guitar etc etc uh, we can see that the tritone in the D flat 7 chord and the tritone in the G 7 chord are the same except switch their roles their uh, placement in the chords are reversed. In other words, one becomes a third where it used to be a flat seven, one becomes a flat seven where it used to be a third. However, don't forget we have this resolution from the tritone. Uh, G7 to C contains this tritone and resolves to two notes of the C chord. Now that same tritone, the theorists of some at some point must have said, well, if it's the same tritone, it must resolve. Uh, the D flat seven should also be able to resolve to C. And this is something called the tritone substitution. It's substituting for another dominant seventh chord, in this case, uh, G seven. Now, the res resolution sounds slightly harsh. Let me show you. Uh, here's D flat seven to D, or to C. Now, uh, the lucky thing is that we can soften the sound of a chord by um, adding thirds on it. So if I make it a ninth chord and a C a major seven. Now if I do what's called a two five one, that'd be D minor G seven C. And uh, if I go D minor seven D flat nine, uh, well, we'll just do the D flat seven. So this is substituting for the G7 chord. Now I said earlier uh, <coughs> there were six functions now with the major minor key system. 5-7 to 1 major, 5-7 to 1 minor, 5-7 to 5-7. Now we also have the phenomenon of, if you notice, D flat 7 is a half step higher than C. So a tritone substitution usually resolves down a half step. So, um, so we have now, D flat seven can resolve to C major. D flat seven can resolve to C minor. In fact, the song uh, Night in Tunisia. It's a D flat nine to C, uh, to, to, uh, C minor. So now uh, that D flat seven resolves down to C, mi C major, down to C minor, and down to uh, C seven. All right.
right? So, in other words, we move from the Greek modes one function resolving to one to six different functions now, um, capable capable of resolving to a major chord, a minor chord, a seventh chord from two different placements, five to one and flat two to one. Flat two just meaning one half step above your target. Okay. All right. So that. Um, so I give you dem the demonstration of how the actual tritone works inside of a dominant seventh chord. Now I'm going to give you a crazy little idea. Um, I, I propose that the tritone interval is the largest interval between any two notes. That sounds ridiculous, though. You'd say, well, it, it occurs in the middle of the scale. What about an octave? That's larger, right? Or, or even uh, a sixth is larger, right? If we look. Let's see, what can we use? All right, so we have this. And uh, so if I go one, two, three, four, five steps, that's obviously large. Or one, two, three, four, five, six steps, that's larger than this thing over here. So why am I saying that this interval right here is the largest interval in music? Well, you see, it's because you can flip any interval, all right? So in other words, uh, if I do a ma uh, uh, a major 7 interval, which is C all the way to B. If I reverse that, I get B to C. Its lowest common denominator becomes a half step. So uh, if I go went through all the intervals, you'd see that actually when I invert these intervals, like say uh, D, uh, F to D, I invert it, it becomes D to F, a small interval. So actually the largest distance you could make between two notes is a tritone. Um, an octave, don't forget, I mean, music is a spiral, so when you go the octave, you're back to, to the same note again in a different octave, but it's still the same note. So, yeah, technically there are larger intervals, but in terms of um, the actual sound quality of an interval, this is the largest distance between any two. Um, it's just a crazy idea I have. Uh, in any case, uh, let's see if there's anything else I could say. I'm going to just give you a preview of secondary dominant chords, and then we're going to go deep into it at another uh, level. So let's say I have the chords of the key of C, C, D minor, E minor, F, G, A minor, right? Now, if you're a guitar player, if you do all your bar chords from the A shape, meaning the root is going to be in the A string, so C, D minor, E minor, F, G, or G7, A minor, right? Notice I'm skipping my seventh step, the diminished, because why? Because it's actually absorbed by the G7 in that key. Now, you'll notice that if I go above the C chord to, to the first form, which is the root in the E string, I get a G7 <laughs> resolves to C, so it's right in the same place. So if I go to a D minor in the key of C, I could do the same thing. E7 resolves to D minor. And when I go to E minor, B7 resolves to E minor. When I go to F, C7 resolves to F. And when I go to G7, D flat, D7 resolves to G7. And you can hear it in that kind of old timey. Right? And finally, when I get to A minor, E7 resolves to A minor. Now, these are all five to one relationships. What do I mean by that? My target is D minor. If I go scales, five scale steps up, one, two, three, four, five, from the C scale, so I'm basically doing a Dorian. That fifth note up is an A. So if I make an A7, that's the five seven of the D minor chord. If I go to E minor, go five scale steps up, one, two, three, four, five, right? That's a B note. B7 resolves to E minor. So if I were to do the entire C scale and resolve uh, each of those chords from their um, secondary dominant chords, we get G7 to C, A7 to D minor, B7 to E minor, C7 to, to F, D7 to G7, E7 to A minor. And it almost sounds very musical when you do that. Um,
classical appeal. You could probably picture the band Queen using uh, that type of movement. And indeed, they, not that particular progression, but yeah, tons of secondary dominant chords. Uh, you can hear it. Generally speaking, these secondary dominants have an old-timey barrel house feel, but don't get caught up in that idea to the point where you you know if you use a secondary dominant it's going to sound old-fashioned not true you could use them in all sorts of ways and they'll sound really cool um, they don't necessarily have to resolve to their target uh, but then let me save all the rest of this stuff for the next lesson let's call this a day it's a lovely rainy day here in Venice and why do I say it's lovely because I don't have any clients to drive to nobody's coming to my place I had all the time in the world to make this video, and if you know anything about Southern California, we need water. So this is a good thing. I'm loving it, except the power went out for a good 45 minutes today, which kind of sucked. You'd be amazed. You know, without the infrastructure, we'd be so screwed. So uh, let's hope that Korea doesn't uh, blast a, an atomic bomb over Los Angeles or any other major city in America because that would create an electromagnetic pulse which would permanently, not temporarily, permanently take down all electronics, fry them completely, and you wouldn't be able to fire them up again or even new electronics that weren't affected. I'm pretty sure it wouldn't be able to be fired up either. I'm not 100% sure on that one, but... Uh, Anything that has um, uh, micro uh, circuitry is, is dead. It may be possible that they'd be able to rebuild. I'm not sure. Who cares? I'm, I'm just blathering on. The coffee kicked in. The kratom kicked in. I'm just really doing fine today. All right, you guys. So have a good one. Uh, thanks for checking out this uh, nerdy stuff that I do. I do appreciate your viewership. And I got two more subscribers today. I'm really happy about that. I turned on a friend of mine uh, today to uh, my Beatles analysis. And by the way, a couple of points here. If you, um, I did very short analyses of uh, songs off Rubber Soul and Revolver, uh, probably even Peppers. So if you guys want more detailed, involved uh, analysis of anything Beatles, just let me know. Just don't make it Revolution 9 or something ridiculous like that or, uh, you know, whatever. Um, so that, and secondly, if you would like to contribute to my cause and uh, help keep me alive, starving musician that I am, uh, you can uh, PayPal me a contribution to uh, paypal.me, not .com, www.paypal.me forward slash vincognito, and uh, you don't have to have a PayPal account to contribute. If you'd like to, that'd be great. I'd love it. Um, I, don't, I don't like money in particular, but I do like to survive. So in any case, be well, you guys. Love you, and I hope you learned something today. That's the most important thing. Take care.